بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على قاتم الأنبياء والمسلمين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد surely all praises belong to Allah سبحانه وتعالى the creator, sustainer, and the controller of the universe and all within. And we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger, the last and the seal of all prophets and messengers, his family, his companions, and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, these days the weather is uh, much better and days are longer. I'm sure that most of us, when we go home in the evenings and the sun is still up, it makes a difference. On Monday, we started talking about one of the important lessons in the aftermath of the Battle of Uhud, which is not to hold grudges and instead to overlook and to forgive people. Today what I would like to do with you is share some thoughts and ideas regarding why holding grudges is such a bad thing. What are some of the negative impacts, if you like, of holding a grudge? I know often when we feel justified in being upset with someone, you know, initially we may feel you may feel good about being upset with this person and not wanting to do anything with this individual. But remember, this is one of the lessons that the Prophet ﷺ taught the Muslims, in particular the Prophet ﷺ after Uhud, because the greater objective was to keep the community together. So nursing grudges, what it actually does is that it works towards splitting up the community and we'll get to that. First of all, when a person holds a grudge, what happens is that person does not want to talk to the other person. And this may go on for an extended period of time. The Prophet ﷺ informed us in the hadith that it's not permissible for a Muslim brother or sister to refuse to talk to his brother or sister for more than three days. You have three days to, as we say, wallow in your sorrows. All right, three days to feel bad and to feel victimized and whatever else. After that, life has to move on. And the Prophet ﷺ also told us in the authentic sunnah that a better of the two people is the one who starts talking first to the other. See, often we feel, well, he wronged me. He should come to me first. The Prophet ﷺ taught us to rise above this sort of petty behavior. We're capable of better than this. So the nature that we have is that we want the other person to make the first move because we believe that they were in the wrong. But the Prophet ﷺ told us that the better of the two people is the one who makes the first move to talk to the other person. Because this again, remember uh, on Monday we talked about, it's one thing to say with your tongue and your lips, look, I forgive you. But we have to mean that. And that's why if you look at that ayah in Surah Al-Imran, Allah says, فَعْفُ عَنْهُمْ Forgive them, overlook them. Overlook their faults and the issues. Then Allah says, وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ Ask Allah's forgiveness for them. This is the proof that you're not just paying lip service to this apology thing, that you, you mean it, you're serious. Seek Allah's forgiveness. And so taking that step to talk to the person is an indication that you are willing to let go, that you're not going to hold this grudge against this person. So that's one problem. The tendency is not to want to talk to the person for an extended period of time. As the Prophet ﷺ told us, it is not allowed to go more than three days without doing so. The second thing is, as a person, as we say, wallows in his or her sorrows, what happens is 
you know, negative thoughts begin to take over your waking moments. And researches have shown that it is very helpful to the individual to think positively. You know, even people in sports, they talk to themselves. They have these sort of personal chats with themselves, positive talk. And often when you do this, you're able to perform even better. And I mean, people do this all the time in sports. Sometimes your team members tell you, look, listen, don't worry, just focus and you'll get over this. Right? So it helps to have a positive attitude as opposed to a negative attitude. In addition to that, what happens is this holding grudges could now lead to backbiting. How? Because now you have your own circle of friends. And you're angry and upset and you know in all the spare time you have you're thinking about this. And don't, for, don't forget shaitan is throwing in his two cents worth. So eventually you begin to tell your friends about this person. Even if it's true, the Prophet ﷺ has warned us, saying something that is bad or negative in the absence of a person is backbiting. When he was asked in the hadith, Malghibatu Ya Rasulullah, what is backbiting, O Messenger of Allah? He said, Dhikruka akhaka bima yakra. You're mentioning a person in their absence, of course, with something that the person will dislike, something bad, something negative. A man said to the Prophet What about if what I'm saying about my brother in his absence is true? The Prophet said If what you say about him is true, you have backbited him. And if, if it is not true what you say about him, you have invented or forged a lie against him, and that of course is worse. Bahatta means to, to invent something that is not true. Right? It's bohutan. So the hadith is clear, even if it's true. And often, sadly, we often justify backbiting by saying it is true, I'm not making this up. So this could lead to backbiting, right? You start telling your friends. Then, the next problem with the grudge is, now you expect your friends not to deal with that individual. Alright, you feel bad when you see your friends or your close friends, mashallah, chatting with that person and even laughing, perhaps sharing jokes. So now you have this expectation that your friends, your circle of friends should sever ties with that person. So what happens is, let's say that that person has the same ideas, now you realize that people are in two groups. That's where the split happens. You see, it seems like a small thing, but, you, but when you look at the reality of the grudge, you can begin to see that it has far-reaching effects in the community. And this is why after the battle of Uhud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet wasalam, and ordered him to bring people together, not to push them away by not holding grudges. Now, if your circle of friends, let's say that, you know, people split up, someone within has a problem with somebody else, then they start to split up as well. And now you can see what happens, right? There's all these little groups all over. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the Prophet salam not to hold grudges against the Sahaba in the battle of Uhud, who disobeyed his order, which, which, with his order, which resulted in the turn of the tide of the battle. And then when that happened, they, some of them lost heart, they were discouraged, and they ran away from the battlefield, and he was calling to them, and they didn't listen to him. Allah told him, don't hold grudges against them. And this is how he was able, that's it, those same companions, to hold them together, and to cement that relationship among the Muslims in Medina, and as a result, they became stronger in the end. And that's what's important, brothers and sisters. It is important that we find a way to put our personal issues aside for the greater good of our community and our society. That's what's important, the jama'ah. 
this is, a, this is a hard lesson we need to learn. Because too often we allow personal issues to split the jama'ah. But this is wrong. Even when the Prophet ﷺ might have been justified in being angry and upset and using these issues to split the people and, you know, abuse them, he didn't. He was ordered by Allah not to. Because to the togetherness is what is important. That is where the strength lies. And that's why in the subsequent battles and expeditions after Uhud, mashallah, the Muslims were united. The Sahaba never ever had any hard feelings for the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because he never abused them. He never insulted them. He didn't hold grudges. Man, you know you guys did this in that battle. He didn't make them feel bad. He didn't belittle them. And they always, so they always had that very good relationship with him. They were always willing to die for him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why? Because of the treatment. As Allah says in the verse at the beginning, فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَّ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ And by the mercy of Allah, or through the mercy of Allah, you were gentle and soft with them. You were gentle and soft with them. You know what, brothers and sisters? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another ayah, Describes the Prophet in terms of his mission to all of mankind. And it's interesting that Allah describes his mission to all of mankind as one of bringing mercy. Of all the descriptions, Allah says Rahmah, mercy and compassion and tolerance, and all the issues and things that are related to mercy. Gentleness, softness, forgiveness, tolerance, you name it. Allah says, and we did not send you, O Muhammad, except as a source of mercy, compassion and tolerance, right? Bringing together as opposed to pushing apart. Forgiving as opposed to holding grudges. Forgiving and pardoning as opposed to being angry and upset. This is how he was able to, subhanAllah, cement with the Sahaba, and create with the Sahaba, and nurture with the Sahaba a very strong and deep relationship that they were willing and happy to put their lives on the line. He didn't just demand that because he was the messenger of Allah. But the Sahaba saw in the Prophet ﷺ a high level of gentleness and compassion and genuine care for people. Genuine care. And as a result, and you know what? This is our nature, brothers and sisters. That if a person is caring with you and gentle with you and compassionate, naturally we have that affinity to what? To gravitate towards such a person. To have a good relationship, to have great respect for that individual. And perhaps to even go out of our way to help that individual. This is how the Prophet ﷺ did it. So the grudge may seem like a, you know, a little thing, not a big deal. It is a big deal though. Hence, it's one of the lessons that Allah taught the Muslims after the Battle of Uhud in order to ensure that they were able to pick up the pieces and move forward united together so that they can come, uh, fulfill their mission of spreading the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the rest of mankind. And we need to do that as well. We need to stand together and not allow these personal issues and grudges to get in the way. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He open our hearts and minds so that we can understand this wonderful message He has revealed for mankind. And may He inspire us all to live by this message. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us and cause us to be among those who are forgiving towards their fellow human beings, in particular their Muslim brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Help us to let go of the grudges we may feel justified in holding against our fellow brothers and sisters. May Allah forgive us and forgive them. And may Allah make us forgiving towards them as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to stay united and to stand together. Because indeed, we have many challenges that are facing us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep all of us firm on the straight path. And may He forgive for us our mistakes and shortcomings. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته